Good evening, everyone. I would like to welcome you to Courageous Community Conversations. This is the first in a series of conversations between a collaboration with the city of Raleigh and the historic Shaw University. We are so thrilled to welcome you this evening to what we hope will be an extraordinary moment of dialogue, conversation, and opportunities for future discussions on race, questions of human difference, and pop, po uh, possibilities for working together to create a meaningful, uh, beloved community. Uh, tonight, we are so happy to have with us Madam President Paulette Dillard from Shaw University and also our Mayor, Mayor Baldwin. Tonight, we will have the opportunity to discuss what we all hope will be the future of conversations around the city of Raleigh, which has to do with human differences. Uh, we're not only talking about issues of race, but also the multiplicity of human differences that has to do with gender, sexual orientation, disabilities, religious differences, and the like. What we hope is that this will be the start and beginning of conversations that will reverberate across the city of Raleigh so that we might learn how to live together in the peaceable, beloved community that Martin Luther King Jr. imagined many, many years ago. These conversations began on the backdrop of the George Floyd protests in 2020, when our visionary leader at, at Shaw University, Madam Paulette Dillard, and the, and the mayor of this wonderful city, uh, Mayor Baldwin, thought about how we can work together to create conversation and dialogue that would be meaningful and lay the groundwork for future conversations on how we can make our city better. Uh, tonight, uh, it is my pleasure and honor, Johnny Bernard Hill, uh, to welcome uh, all of you tonight again. And also at this time, I would like to welcome Madam President Paulette Dillard and also our Mayor, Mayor Baldwin, to the podium. Mayor, Mayor Baldwin. I like to think of this as a moment in history, a moment that cannot be wasted. Last year, last summer, we saw violence, we saw frustration, we saw anger directed at many people, especially people of color. And in conversations with Dr. Hill and this, um, Center for Racial and Social Justice at Shaw, we came together in partnership to say, how can we bring people together? How can we have these important conversations? But most importantly, how can we enact change? So while these conversations will be happening starting this evening, what will ultimately occur is we will have a 10 point plan on ways that the city can create more equity, create more inclusion, not just for some groups, but for all groups. Tonight, we have people here representing people with disabilities. We have people here representing people of color. We have people here representing those in our community who are most vulnerable. And it's our job as leaders but it's also our job in the community to make life better for everybody. You know, if I had a magic wand, the thing I would do is eradicate poverty because poverty is a lot of what causes inequities. It also prevents people from getting the opportunities that they deserve. So we're going to have these difficult conversations, but more importantly, we, me as the mayor and the city council are gonna take action to stem the tide, to make it better, and to do all that we can do. That is my promise. And I just wanna say thank you, all the panelists for starting this conversation off. I wanna say thank you to Dr. Dillard for being our partner. And I also wanna thank all of our community and encourage all of you to be open-minded, to be kind, to be empathetic, and try to understand what other people may be going through. 
You may not see it. You may not know it. All the more reason why it's important to ensure that you have compassion and show the best for each other. Raleigh is that community. We're compassionate. We are progressive. We are innovative. And we're going to prove that in how we move forward, creating a more just society. Thank you. Dr. Dillard. Good evening. It is indeed a pleasure to see this event come to be. It has been a conversation. It has been a desire on the part of Mayor Baldwin. It has been Shaw's uh, desire to engage with all constituents of our beautiful city to have conversation. And as an academic, you know, we, we really think about what is really meant by conversation. Conversation is an interactive exchange. Conversation is not talking at each other. Conversation is about getting to understanding. And this very first conversation is to begin to understand and hear the differences that make us such a beautiful city. And as a president of a historically black college and university, as the president of the cooperating Raleigh colleges here in the city of Raleigh, the academy has a responsibility. And because it trains young people, we have to teach them that there is a way to solve problems. And it's not always by violence or other actions, although sometimes out of frustration and the inability to have conversation, then violence erupts as a result. And we want to take seriously the training of our young people so they can see it modeled how you have a conversation and how everyone is included in that conversation. And so tonight we've brought together elements of our city based on feedback that we receive by way of a survey to find out what you, our community, wanted to talk about. And we assembled a group of individuals who could have that meaningful conversation for us to get started. So I have high hopes for the 10-point plan that will result from these conversations. I am excited about engaging our college students in this process because they will set, they will be sitting in the roles that we now sit in in the very near future. And we want them to know how to solve problems, how to have conversation, how to drive change. And so that is why I am so excited tonight and so excited about the conversations that will take place following this conversation. And lest I use up all the time <laughs> that we have allotted for these amazing panelists, I just wanna to say to everyone who's tuning in, welcome. We want your feedback. This genuinely is a conversation and we are looking forward to beginning to make a difference, to drive to what the mayor said, equity for all. Because if we are all engaged, we can't help but continue to be the city that is already recognized on so many fronts. And we wanna be able to say it is a city 
for all. And we helped to lead that initiative. Thank you very much. And I look forward to this panel discussion this evening. And now I turn the podium over to uh, Dean Valerie Johnson. Good evening again, everyone, and it is my delight and pleasure to be standing before you as we start these conversations. My role here is to be able to introduce to you one of our leading persons at the university. Her name is Dr. Erin Moore. She is our new executive director of the Center for Racial and Social Justice. We are so excited to have her here with us. It is for such a time as this that Dr. Moore has come to be the shepherd of our Center for Racial and Social Justice. She has an extensive CV, but you need to know a little bit about her to understand why she's moderating, why she is at the helm of, this conver of these conversations and of our center. Dr. Moore received her BA in economics from Spelman College, my alma mater as well, <laughs> a MA from a in African American studies from The Ohio State University, and her PhD in Amer African American studies from Temple University in Philadelphia. Not only is, does she have the qualifications through education, but also through professional experience. She, until recently, was the diversity, equity, and inclusion consultant for the Equity Leadership Group, and she still serves in that capacity as a consultant. She has served as the executive director for the Community Invested Investment Network in Atlanta, Georgia as well as public education coordinator, the Maurice and Jane Sugar Law Center for Economic and Social Justice, Detroit, Michigan. She blends not only activism, but scholarship and community awareness with the legal and economic mind that I am delighted to get to know more and more. So it is my pleasure, my honor, to bring to the podium now our moderator for this evening's conversations, Dr. Erin Moore. Thank you, Dean Johnson, for those lovely words. And thank you all for attending and participating. It is my honor to serve in this role as the Executive Director for the Center for Racial and Social Justice. I'm a native of Durham, North Carolina, so it's an honor to return home to my state. I'm well-versed in the history of Shaw University, and it's just really a pleasure and an honor to be serving in this institution. So for those of you that are joining in, thank you, welcome. This is a little bit different than what we had initially planned, we wanted to have our panelists in front of a live audience, but for safety's sake, we decided we're going to be virtual uh, for COVID-19, so thank you for tuning in. There's a lot of things we're gonna get to this evening. As President Dillard and the mayor mentioned, they, we did a survey about some of the issues that the citizens of Raleigh are facing. And this is the first of our four conversations that have come from that survey. The theme for tonight is understanding the different forms of discrimination, race, gender, sexual orientation, ability, age, and religion. But before I continue, I wanna let you know we're going to have three other additional conversations in the future. On Saturday, August 28th at 1 p.m., our conversations will be about affordable housing and education. On Thursday, September 9th at 7 p.m., our conversation will be about access to transportation and employment opportunities. And on Saturday, September 18th at 1 p.m., we'll be talking about policing and mental health. We also will have very lively panelists to help lead the conversation. So with that, I'd like to introduce our panelists this evening. I'll be starting with my immediate, my far right. <laughs> our first guest this evening is Ms. Vicki Smith. Vicki Smith is the executive director of the Alliance for Disability Advocates, a federally funded center for independent living. Prior to working with the Alliance, 
She was the executive director of Disability Rights North Carolina from 2007 to 2018. Ms. Smith began her career as a special education teacher in rural West Virginia before there was a federally mandated law that said that dis students with disabilities had to go to public schools. She has over 48 years as a disability advocate, including 10 years at the National Disability Rights Network in Washington, DC, where she led training, technical assistance, and disability for disability advocacy organizations. My next panelist is Mrs. Anna Elrasa Blackburn. <laughs> Ms. Blackburn is one of the North Carolina Tri Chairs for the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. She's also the first Latino immigrant liaison for the North Carolina NAACP. She firmly believes in the idea that I am my brother's keeper and works to unite poor people across lines of race and geography as well as ensuring that Latino and Latina voices are heard within organizations, community, and government. In addition to her community activism, she has over 10 years as a first responder, serving as a firefighter, first fire service instructor, and law enforcement first responder instructor for 15 years. She is the founder and the president of Response Management Training, where she serves as an emergency medical instructor. And for her work in the community, Anna was a recipient of the 2018 Shaw University Sarah Baker Leonard Topper Award for outstanding contributions to community service and social justice. Third, we have Mr. Gerald Givens Jr. He was the president of the Raleigh Apex NAACP, where he services over nine over 900,000 residents. In addition to his leadership with the national and state NAACP, he has served in leadership positions in a variety of community organizations, including the Wake County Remembrance Project, North Carolinians Against Gun Violence, the North Carolina Transit Workers, Activate Good, and the Rotary Club for All Nations. Mr. Givens has an impressive, impressive 20-year career in the United States Air Force and as a veteran of the Iraq and the Afghanistan wars. In addition to his military service, Mr. Givens has been an entrepreneur and worked with nonprofit and government organizations. Thank you. And finally, to my immediate right, we have Pastor Nancy E. Petty. She began her ministry at Pullen Memorial Baptist Church in June of 1992 and has served in the role of senior pastor since 2002. Prior to being called as the senior pastor, she served Pullen as a minister of Christian education and as associate pastor. Pastor Nancy is known as a community faith leader, speaking out on issues of social justice, interreligious dialogue, and the inclusions of the LGBTQIA community. She, she is a contributor to several books about the Moral Monday movement and has won numerous awards across the city and the state. She's chair of the Board of Repairers of the Breach, a nonprofit that seeks to build a moral agenda rooted in the framework that uplifts our deepest moral and constitutional values to redeem the heart and soul of our country. The Center of American Progress has listed Pastor Nancy as one of the nine ministers to watch in 2019. So I'd like to thank all of you for coming. I know I wish we had an audience to give you a round of applause, so thank you, thank you so much. So what I'm gonna do now in order to get your participation, so I'm gonna log into the community, and uh, to my laptop, I'm sorry, so we can get your questions. I know some of you are on Facebook Live, on some of our other platforms, so please type in your questions. We should be able to see them. And while I'm doing that, I'm gonna have each of my panelists have an opening statement, starting with Ms. Smith. Uh, good evening, and thank you for inviting me to be part of this um, new initiative. I'm really excited to watch how it grows and how it changes the community. So I am the executive director of Alliance of Disability Advocates, which is a center for independent living that serves the Raleigh, Durham, and surrounding areas. Our mission is to help people with disability, any kind of disability, to find and live successfully in the community of their choice, not one that is chosen for them. Um, in the world of disability, the first thing that uh, we want to do is to make sure that every event is accessible to 
all people with disabilities. And so we typically start um, a presentation with a visu visual description of each speaker. So I'm gonna model this for my um, cohort here and, uh, and uh, hopefully make it accessible to those people who are just listening to this program. So I am an older white woman uh, with white hair um, and I wear glasses. Um, I uh, have on a blue striped shirt. Um, I'm sitting at a table that uh, has a black tablecloth in front of a microphone and behind me is a picture or a poster um, that talks about some of the history of Raleigh. Um, so uh, the goal, so that's, a, that's a, called a, a visual description of um, who you, what you look like. Um, so the goal of disability advocates um, is to help people with disabilities find a community. Um, and that means uh, of their choice. So often people with disabilities, um, are, are, uh, decisions are made for them um, because they are thought to be less than equal or less than capable. And sometimes the only difference um, that really matters is that they, that they just get to where they need to go in a different fashion. Um, so uh, we uh, are an agency that hires um, people with disabilities and the majority of our staff have disabilities. So uh, I think that it's important to, uh, to say that so often discrimination happens based on what people see of us or their perceptions of what society um, has given um, our particular um, designation. Uh, disability, in its very word, starts with a negative, and it turns a positive statement, ability, a positive word, into a negative word. It focuses on what people might be able to not do or implies that they are not able to do instead of what they can do. Um, our goal is to really look at um, and help people find different ways of achieving their goals. And I, I want to stress that for people with disabilities, um, that, it's, that we do things differently. It's not that we don't do them. It's just that we need to do things differently. Um, but over the years, many of the words, uh, especially in the early history of the disability movement, had very negative connotations. Um, words like crazy um, or idiots or uh, stupid um, are often words uh, that uh, identify uh, a, an individual with disabilities. We, um, we believe that given the appropriate supports and services that a person with a disability can achieve almost anything that a peer without a disability could do um, if we just take the time to figure out how to adapt and change the community to make it more accessible. Um, I think I'm going to end there um, because I want to really have and allow a lot of time to um, talk. So thank you for. Okay, thank you. Is that okay. <laughs> Buenas noches, soy Ana Ilarraza Blackburn. Good evening, I'm Ana Ilarraza Blackburn. It's real, a true privilege to be here and I wanna thank Shaw University for the opportunity to be here as a panelist. I feel like I'm coming home every time I'm participating and engaging with Shaw as I have been engaging closely for the last five years with Shaw's Black and Brown Women's Initiative and um, organizing the HK on J Coalition uh, participation with Shaw University. So thank you. And I I'm also excited to be here on the panel to be with Reverend Petty and Gerald Givens because we have been moving and engaging the community towards sustainable change of equity and justice for all. So, um, so I, I feel at home here. <laughs> <laughs> I do want to say that um, 
raised by a strong um, single mother, raising three daughters, strong, empowered Latina woman. One of the things that I have learned is that um, injustice and inequality comes in many forms. And sometimes all those forms can erupt in just one household and in one community. Um, my goal as a community leader as an organizer and as an activist is to ensure to engage and help um, educate and inform the community uh, to come out of our silos and come together and not allow ourselves to be divided because together we're stronger. And the other thing that we must realize whenever I think about democracy is that this nation has yet to give birth to what true democracy looks like. We have yet to give birth to that. So it behooved me as I grew and saw that strong Latina woman before me, I said, I therefore would carry on what was taught to me in order to ensure that my voice and my community was engaged and their issues and plights were in the forefront. So thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, thank you to Dr. Dillard, to the mayor, to Dr. Johnson, Dr. Moore, um, Dr. Hill, especially for giving us this opportunity to be here on this historic night and this historic moment. To my panelists and all the great work that we're doing, Let's all stay safe so we can continue on doing it. Of the 2,040 something people who made it to the Forbes list of the world's billionaires, 11 of them are black. Of the 540 billionaires in America, four of them are African American. Most of the men and women in this room today understand racial and economic injustice are twins that we must eliminate injustices within the aspects of economics, education, entertainment, environment, labor, law, politics, religion, sexual orientation, and technology. We accomplish this by revealing the truth, producing justice every day in our thoughts, speech, and actions. Sounds simple and easy. However, most of us from know from history and experience that it's not. Shaw University, the oldest historically black college and university in the entire South, located right here in the heart of Raleigh. The Civil War ended in April 1865 and Shaw was founded in December. And the HBCU that I attended, Lincoln University, with LU and Jeff City, <laughs> was founded in January 1886. 1866. After being enslaved, our ancestors understood the necessity of education, the process of learning all things. They knew from experience that racists preferred to continue racism, falsehood, injustice, and incorrectness. Our ancestors needed institution like Shaw to reveal the truth. They understood it was vital to gain the knowledge to eliminate racism in order to produce a kind of justice that Anna just talked about, mm -hmm. of a new America. With each generation gaining more knowledge than the previous in the midst of Jim Crow, racial terror, and less than 100 years later, the civil rights movement began. Thurgood Marshall, Howard, Dr. King, mm -hmm. Morehouse, Ella Baker, Shaw were all right in the middle of it. Knowledge is a requirement for freedom. Thurgood Marshall won 29 of his 32 cases. He argued before the Supreme Court. Knowledge. King discovered the triple evils of racism, poverty, and militarism that impact the world. Knowledge. Ella Baker worked with all of them and understood that the movement is like a tree. It grows from the bottom up and not top down. Its roots are with the people. Marshall, King, and Baker, they weren't trying to coexist with racism. 
they wanted to eliminate it. And they were revealing the truth and producing justice and correctness in our society. As Raleigh's NAACP president, that's exactly what you'll see me do in my thoughts, my speech, and my actions. Eliminate racism, tell the truth, and produce justice the Shaw University way. Well, I want to also express my gratitude to all the leaders of Shaw University for leading in this courageous community conversation around systemic discrimination and, and, and uh, racism and, and discrimination in all its forms. The city of Raleigh, while voted one of the best places to live in the U.S., has miles to traverse in becoming a just and equitable society and to improve the quality of life for all of her citizens. The Courageous Community Conversation Survey states in its report this, systemic discrimination is baked into our social societal norms and unconscious bias. It's hard to pinpoint a place where it is most common because it underlies so many aspects of our society. I would amend that statement to say that systemic discrimination underlies every aspect of our society in the city of Raleigh. Just to name a few, the housing market, the judicial criminal justice system, including our policing, access to local and state government services and resources, and access to high quality education for all of our children. Low income, marginalized populations, people of color and disabled persons suffer the most under these discriminatory systems. We know this, the data is everywhere. And the LGBTQIA community are the fastest growing demographic of homelessness, food insecurity, and lack of medical care. They are discriminated against in, dis in employment, housing, and health care at a fast growing pace. We know who is most impacted by systemic discrimination when it comes to racial, sexual, and gender discrimination. Brown and black bodies, women, and LGBTQIA persons. On every level in the city of Raleigh, these folks are on a daily basis facing discrimination. In my closing, I want to address another who. If we know who is impacted, who is responsible for all of this discrimination? in no specific order, local elected leaders. To our local elected leaders, progress has to be seen as more than taller buildings and sterile neighborhoods where everyone looks the same. Sometimes I wonder if leaders understand that progress is about the quality of life for all citizens and equal access to resources and not just for some. From our mayor to city council members to county commissioners to those leading our policing, anyone who is an elected official or appointed to a job by the city of Raleigh, they are responsible. White people, if you are white, you are privileged. And whether conscious or unconscious, we bear a responsibility for the systemic discrimination and racism in our city. White people, we must wake up and change how we are living our lives. Faith leaders and religious institutions, we are some of the worst when it comes to participating in dis systemic discrimination. We need to look at that and change our systems. We are responsible. Systems are bigger than individuals, but individuals make up systems. That's right. Until individuals band together to change the system, we will continue to prop up and support the systems of discrimination in this city. We must make change. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before we begin, some of the participants, the audience can't hear your microphone, so if you could move it a little closer, perhaps. And I think there's a volume if you could somewhere if you could turn that up a little bit, that would be great. 
Okay, we're starting to have some questions come in from our audience, but one of the one of the things I'd like to start off by asking, if you all could just provide in your view, maybe a one or two sentence definition of what is discrimination? Because if you read the responses, everybody has a different idea. So what is discrimination to you? Ms. Smith, we'll start with you and come and work our way down. Um, I think that for a lot of people living with a disability, uh, discrimination is based in uh, being perceived as less than mm -hmm. um, uh, because of ability um, that that discrimination starts uh, early in school in terms of even some of the entitlements like uh, the uh, Education for Handicapped Children's Act was to create access to a free and appropriate public education for kids with disabilities. But by that very nature, which was a wonderful thing, um, it did elevate and highlight the differences between a child with a disability and normal peers. Um, so I, I think it, it also has to do with um, that a community is inaccessible by design um, in terms of its architecture. So, it, so often in order to create equal access, we have to go in and not just change minds, but change buildings and sidewalks and doors. Um, I even see a little ridge uh, in between this room and the next. It looks very, very small, but I have an employee where that could be a very huge barrier. And so um, most, uh, not always, but a lot of times it is um, it often a barrier is, is uh, an aesthetic um, is often becomes a barrier. Thank you. Is it, what was it again? Discrimination? How do you define, how do you, or you, how do you define or understand discrimination? Um, one form, I, I would say that discrimination is actually depicting a false narrative of either an individual or a community based on false facts that then puts a target on the individual or on that community. That's good. That's good. Okay. From my experience as being president of the NEACP and having to deal with discrimination uh, of all kinds in our city, I would say that discrimination is power with prejudice being used to create an advantage for somebody and to create a disadvantage for someone else. That's what my experience as the city's NEACP president, that's what I've learned. Love that power, prejudice. Mm -hmm. So, from from my faith uh, background, um, I am I believe and taught and I'm taught that every single person is created in the image of God, mm -hmm. and every single person embodies the divine spark and essence of our Creator God. Mm -hmm. And any time that divine essence is not recognized and respected and treated with, um, with respect, there is discrimination. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean to um, focus discrimination on individuals because we are talking about systemic discrimination. And I think that plays out in our systems as well. When our systems fail to see us all as equal human beings created in the image of God and treat some differently because of their skin color or their gender or their sexual orientation or their some ability that somebody has labeled as important, more important than any other, we see discrimination on those levels. Thank you. Those were all excellent 
And I'm going to go back and record them and write them down <laughs> so we can use them in our classrooms. <laughs> and that's it's important because, you know, we're in an educational institution. We have to define our terms so that everybody can understand what it is that we're talking about. Um, and before I move on to another question, I've been receiving some questions throughout the day. Um, and one of the things that I found pretty common through some of these questions and comments from the survey is that there's a significant number of people who don't really believe that discrimination, ex that, it, that it exists. And some of them believe that if we talk about racism and discrimination, it makes it worse. And so the question that I've always had is, how do you get people who maybe never experienced discrimination to understand and validate the experiences of other people. Other people are coming to you and saying, I've had this experience. And then other people are like, well, no, that's not real, that's not happening. So how do you bring those people into the conversation to say, this is a valid and real experience. This actually happens. We'll start with you. I, I think you have to get people in the room mm -hmm. listening to one another. I, I can't, I don't know that it's effective for me to go to someone and try to describe someone else's experience with discrimination. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll give you a little anecdote. So in, in my church, we had this situation where there were some people who loved the organ being played at its loudest, you know, just that vibrating organ loud thing. And some people who said that just destroyed their worship, you know, mm -hmm. and just like, I can't worship when they blare that organ like that. So I got these people in a room together mm -hmm. and it was fascinating to watch the light bulb go off when this person said that organ at its loudest makes my worship experience. And this person said that organ at its loudest destroys my worship experience. Mm -hmm. And it was like, oh my gosh, all of a sudden, they were faced with, we have different experiences mm -hmm. and that doesn't mean yours isn't important and valid right. or that mine isn't. But I think in, in to talk about and get folks who say, oh, discrimination is not an issue or we shouldn't talk about it. I think to, to say to those people, would you be willing to sit in a circle and have conversation mm -hmm. with why you think that is so and ha hear someone else talk about how they have felt discriminated against. Mm -hmm. Exactly what you're trying to do with these conversations. Right. I, in my, I have a presentation called Dismantling Systemic Racism. And I use the example of my, my hometown, St. Louis, Missouri. And I use my grandmother. In St. Louis, they have something called the Del Mar Divide. It's a social, economic, and racial divide in St. Louis. In 1971, when my grandmother purchased a home, she purchased it in the area where only black people could buy homes in the city of St. Louis. And when she bought her home there, it was valued at like 20 something thousand dollars. Today, my grandmother's home is valued at sixty five thousand dollars. But the average black home and my grandmother's and the average white home where she was restricted from being able to buy a home those home values are over $335,000. That is a classic example of systemic and economic racism in America that steals wealth away from, from generations. Um, well, as an impacted Latina woman and as an activist, um, one of the things that I've learned and have found is that many a times when you find people that say, no, that doesn't exist. You know, I've never had that happen to me. One of the things that um, I've encountered is that many of people also do not want to confront that issue mm -hmm. because then they must answer the question, am I mm -hmm. racist? Mm -hmm. and, and that is what I have found. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, to echo um, Reverend Petty, putting someone in a room and not allowing your truth to be discounted mm -hmm. is important to the one that does not want to receive it mm -hmm. because your truth is your truth right. and that cannot be taken away. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things that I have found and walking in a day and a life of someone that is keeps echoing 
I've never experienced that. Mm -hmm. And the first thing that I say is, it sounds like privilege, huh? Mm -hmm. Because it is. Mm -hmm. So another thing that I would like to say is don't ever allow anyone to take your truth because people might be uncomfortable in a room to hear it because that is one of the first ways of dismantling racism. Absolutely. Thank you. So in the world of disability, um, we have something that perhaps uh, makes it a little bit easier for us to develop empathy, um, which I think is probably uh, one of the common traits that's missing um, from most of Americans um, and f for a large majority of white people they because they can't put themselves in another person's shoes. Mm -hmm. In terms of disabilities, we actually have a lot of s uh, simulations that we can do. So we can, um, you want to find out what it's like to need to navigate around Shaw University in a wheelchair, wow. yeah. um, we can bring you a wheelchair yeah. and you mm -hmm. can try to get from point A to mm -hmm. point B mm -hmm. or not. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to find out what it's like to be visually impaired, we can cover your eyes mm -hmm. and, um, and you can learn how to navigate around a room that mm -hmm. you can't see. Mm -hmm. um, we can uh, do that for people who are uh, to simulate deaf and hard of hearing. Um, we even have ways um, and some exercises to help, um, uh, especially children. This works better with children mm -hmm. when they're young, not so much with adults sometimes, mm -hmm. um, about what it's like uh, to be, quote, different uh, in right. terms of how you speak or how you process information. So I think we have a bit of an advantage at this table yeah. um, in, in developing empathy. But if we could somehow teach that, yeah. then I think all of our lives would be different. Absolutely. I think that's an awesome program that should be in schools all over this country. You know, as you said, it works well with school children, but that's how you learn. You know, I can't even imagine walking around here without my sight. You know, this is such a visually stimulating space and there's so much to look at. But if you didn't have sight, you wouldn't be able to experience that. And, and really to kind of understand what people go through. So I think that's, that's, those are great ideas. But, but we could do visual, we, we could do descriptions and there are people who are very skilled at it. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Okay, well, we've had several, several questions and comments <laughs> about politics, the city council, some of the laws that they have passed that are hurting citizens, particularly Southeast Raleigh. Housing from the survey was very big. That's going to be a big conversation next week. Um, so people are questioning, what can we do when city council passes laws uh, that are promoting development, that are harming you know, communities of color? We try to protest, we try to state our views, and nothing seems to change. So their question is, you know, of course we don't know what's gonna come out of this plan, but really how can we engage the political system or how can the political system be more responsive to what some of our needs are? What is it that's gonna to have to change on some sort of fundamental level of communication, level of advocacy that's really gonna to have to change the experiences and lives of our citizens? So I'm gonna start with Pastor Nancy since you spoke on politics so well. <laughs> yeah. So um, the citizens have, have got to get involved. Okay. And we have to vote in um, elected officials who understand these issues, who have empathy, and who uh, make strong commitments to making change versus just talking about change. And, mm -hmm. and that's on us as citizens. Now, we are facing these voting laws that are restricting voting. We have to fight those as well. But it, it really comes down to the citizens of Raleigh getting involved and with our vote and our voice electing leaders who understand these issues and who will make change happen, not just talk about change over here, but do this over here. And we mm -hmm. see that constantly 
in, in our city. And I, I'm sorry to say it that way, but, but we just keep thinking that prog or, or it seems to me our elected leaders only understand progress under mm -hmm. one umbrella, and that is bigger, better, you know, development, 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 development. And that's not always progress. Mm -hmm. Progress is about how you treat your citizens on every level and that you treat citizens um, with respect, you don't you don't go in and and build huge complexes that's going to send water downstream that's going to wipe out neighborhoods uh, that are predominantly African American neighborhoods. You you don't make those kinds of decisions, and and you listen to people who are saying our churches and our homes are going to be destroyed by these decisions you're making. And so if 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 elected officials can't understand that, then as citizens, we got to vote them out and vote in people who do understand it. That's, that's what I think. Uh, you know, I try to educate people about where we are and try to keep things into perspective that we're very young into our freedom. Our city has its first black firefighter, fire chief now it has its first black uh city manager now the first black county manager now we're just getting some of the pieces onto the chessboard that can empathize with our community and and our needs and and our and our wants but like reverend petty said that also in, that means that we have to be engaged just that much more and we have to understand that true integration is sharing power and sharing resources. And we're still at the emphasis of doing that here in Raleigh and across the nation. So I echo what, 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 what Reverend Petty just said. We have to be engaged. And that means that you have to show up for the presidential election and then the midterm elections right. and then the municipal elections right. is something that you have to do ongoing all the time. And we can't celebrate when we increase voter participation by 15,000 votes when really what we needed to do is increase it by 50. That's right. That's right. I, I love this question. I really do. Because one of the things that we tend to forget is that power rises from the people. You may not get the change right now that you want, and you may not even get it immediately. But this is what I want you to remember. When we come out of our silos and we come together, especially in numbers, power, your power increases. Why do I say that? Because, let me give you an example. The way you're gonna get your city council and county commissioners to push your agenda is to find other groups and people that share that agenda. So what do I mean? For instance, the immigration community, right? If you follow the numbers, politics is a number game. In 2016, um, immigrants nationalizing for 2016 was 16,296, right? That number seems low. But see, when they started looking down, you had to follow the numbers. Years ahead, you f had to follow the numbers. And all of a sudden, from 2016 to now, the immigrant community was experiencing here in North Carolina an uptick on anti-immigrant bills. Why? Because the political parties were following the numbers. And this is what happened. When they looked down to see how many people would naturalize by 2020, here's what the numbers showed. 2016, 16,296. But in 2020, here in North Carolina, 48,887 people naturalized. 
there's your power. Right. You find and you go and find other organizations and people with your issues and you go to that county commissioner, you go to that city council and said, this is our agenda. Pass it or we vote you out and get your people registered and to the voting booth. Registering is not good enough. It means nothing if you don't vote. So gone last means almost everybody here stole um, what I was going to say. Um, but I'm going to take it back. I, I think it is that um, we study the 2020 uh, census. I've been looking at that and making notes. Um, disability cuts across kind of all of the subcategories. So, um, you know, what we want to do is, is if we all come together in coalitions, um, then we have power. And we, that doesn't mean we're going to agree on every single issue. There might be some that actually we can't agree on. But I think if we can come to agreement and sometimes agree to disagree but still work in coalition, then we can make a change. But we have to get people registered and we have to get people out to vote. And we can't wait until six weeks before the election because it makes us vulnerable to, um, well, the uh, people that are currently in charge. Yeah. And, and, now, um, and we see that playing out right uh, now. Exactly. And I'll add one last little thing on this question. You have to do what the city of Raleigh did when they did a, a, an assessment of looking at where their staffing was. When they looked at their staffing, they saw that the folks who were in white collar jobs eight times out of ten were white. And then they looked at the folks who worked in transportation and sanitation and all of those jobs were nine times out of ten people of color. Why do you, you have to, to see the truth color. so that you can see exactly what's going on. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, we're getting very, very close. Hold on one second. We're getting very close to the top of the hour, but we have one more question that I'd like uh, to ask. Um, if you come from and live within a system that works for you, how do you convince other people to change the system? How do you convince them that your values and the issues that we're talking about, that you know, we want to get these issues that are going to be fair and equitable, how can you convince other people that these issues are important and vital to them? That's going to have to be our last question, and then we'll just have you guys. We'll let them know first since I've gone first. <laughs> I think that you 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 do that by and what I do in our NAACP branch is we combat racism and then we do community service. We go to places and we visit people who are in need, who are less fortunate than than we are so that we can be able to identify with those people and help them improve what Again, what Reverend Petty said, the quality of life. What's the point of us being able to have the number two city, the best city in the nation, if you still have people, like I saw the other day, laying underneath a, a tree, going to sleep at 930 at night because they're homeless? Those are the type of issues that we have to identify with. We can't, in the military, I'm a military man. If we saw a piece of paper that was sitting on the, uh, on the ground and we walked past it and a sergeant saw us walk past that and he'd pull us over, make us go pick it up and tell us you don't walk past problems. But that's exactly what we're doing every single day. Those pieces of paper are all over our city and too many people are just walking past them. Now, what was the, the question again that if there are some people who were born into this particular system and okay. benefit from it. it right. From them. Okay. How do you convince them that the system needs changing? Well, you know, raised with the ideolo ideology that I am my brother's keeper, I have a problem even thinking about that. I have to convince someone that if you see someone help homeless or someone that needs food, that I have to convince you that it's to your benefit to extend and hand out. It's just a moral obligation that we have to care for each other. And when we lift from the bottom up, we all rise because we're changing policies or taxes to help 
another segment of our, of our community or another department, it doesn't mean that we're taking away from those that have. What we're saying is that we're reaching out in order to establish a more humane and civilized society. And I would think that's what we would all want. So lifting from the bottom up, we all are lifted together. And it's a moral uh, uh, thing just to do for one another. Unfortunately, we don't live in a moral society or we wouldn't be in this room. And so um, I think what we have to do is figure out a way to learn how to speak the other person's language. Um, words mean different things in different communities. Um, and, and I used to think I knew just about everything. Um, and I continue to learn that I have only learned just a small, tiny part of what um, is available to me. So I think creating a safe place to have conversations like this is critical. Um, and it might be that the series will reach uh, several people, like housing does impact uh, anyone who's poor um, in this city. Um, but in, in particular, people of color um, because of discrimination. But if we really look at uh, how to address the bigger issue that there is just not enough housing to go around, good, affordable, safe neighborhoods, um, and, uh, and keep working, I, I just think we can't quit. I mean, it's too important. And, um, and we have to look and start working with the younger generation much earlier. Um, because what we've learned during COVID is that there is a great equalizer out there. Um, uh, and, and, it, and it is not necessarily COVID, it's affordable, accessible health care. So Dr. Moore, I want to answer your question with an idea for your 10 point plan coming up. So I would like to propose that every elected city official, mayor, city council member, county commissioner, police chief, if you're in an elected position within our city, that you're required to spend four hours a week with someone in the community doing social justice work such that those folks are sitting with us as we listen to the young LGBTQIA person whose parents have just kicked them out of their home because they came out. Now they're homeless, they're food insecure, and our city has very few resources for that individual. Or to go with my colleague here, Gerald, to some of these areas in our community where they're doing work with people who are, who have higher needs, less fortunate than we say than some of us, but that they actually, our elected officials actually spend hours each week engaging and interacting with the people they say they want to serve and to make this city a better, more equitable, just, kind, compassionate city for everyone. So that's how I would answer that question. And that is a great way to end our conversation. And as you can see, ladies and gentlemen, there's so much more to talk about. An hour is just really not enough time. <laughs> we could talk about this for the next two or three hours and be here all night especially me. But thank you all for tuning in. Our next community conversation will be Saturday, August 28th at 1 p.m. It will be live streamed again. Um, and we'll be talking about affordable housing and education, some of these issues that are very, very important to all of you. Some of you have been asking questions about how to see this program again. It will be posted on the City of Raleigh's website as well as on Shaw University's website. Um, we're gonna edit it 
down, I think just for, you know, for clarity's sake. Uh, but all of these conversations will be posted um, in a couple days, some early next week, I believe, so that if you, if you missed it or if you have friends who want to come back and watch the conversation later, um, that would be uh, available for all of you all to watch. Another thing is we have some questions, not as many as I thought. So we're going to maybe look into a way maybe you can submit your questions ahead of time. There were some people who already sent emails and questions, which is great. So again, our next topic is affordable housing and education. If there's some things that you are really concerned about, bring your questions and we'll look forward to another great conversation. So thank you all for tuning in. Thank you all to our wonderful panelists. This has been great. I could just listen to all of you and learn from all of you. <laughs> the work that you've done has been tremendous. And on behalf of the citizens of Raleigh, we thank you very much for your work and hope thank that you'll you. continue. So thank you. thank you. Thank you all and good night. We look forward to you next time.